How could an aircraft descend to six feet, that's only 183 centimeters over the ground, almost a full mile away from the airport, without the pilots noticing it? That's the mystery I will explain to you in today's video, so stay tuned. The story I'm going to tell you today is based on a very complete interim report by the French authorities, the BEA. Now, the reason I've chosen to use an interim report rather than a final report, which I normally always do, is because this story highlights some very important safety lessons that I want to share with you guys. The incident took place on the 23rd of May 2022 on a flight between Stockholm Arlanda in Sweden and Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport in France. The aircraft that was being flown was a 23-year-old Airbus A320 that was operated by a Maltese airline called Airhub Airlines and it was operating on something called an ACMI wet lease agreement with Norwegian Air Shuttle. An ACMI wet lease agreement basically means that the company that is leasing out the aircraft, in this case Airhub Airlines, is providing both the aircraft crew maintenance and insurance, basically the entire operation, to the lessee company. So the tickets that the passengers would have bought would have been with Norwegian Air Shuttle, but the company that was actually doing everything was Airhub Airlines. And in the media report that was issued after this interim report was released, that wasn't made very clear. Anyway, the two pilots that was going to operate this flight were employed by Airhub Airlines and they started the day just like any other day by going through the pre-flight preparation, checking the weather, no thumbs, on route weather and fuel calculations. Now we don't know the age and experience of the pilots because as I mentioned before this is based on an interim report but what we do know is that the weather they were presented with was quite nice. There was no problems forecasted on route and at their destination airport Paris it also looked quite okay, with some scattered clouds at 1500 feet, good visibility, light winds from the west, but also mentioning of some temporary rain showers and cumulonimbus activity around the airport. Those types of clouds and rain showers are very common in Europe this time of year and not normally of a huge concern to pilots as long as they're not frequent or forecasted together with thunderstorms or hail because they tend to be of a very transitory nature. They tend to move away very quickly and even if they don't, as long as it's only rain, since the aircraft are not made of sugar, we can just fly straight through them. So the pilots wouldn't have thought much about this, but in this case, they're actually going to play a fairly important role. When the pilots had finished their pre-flight preparation, they went and they briefed their cabin crew and then they walked all together out towards the aircraft. They decided that the captain was going to be pilot flying for the first leg and the first officer pilot monitoring and then they would switch. Something that we normally do as we try to get the equal amount of exposure to both roles during any given day. The captain checked the technical status of the aircraft, which was found to be perfectly in working order, and then he started doing the pre-flight preparation as the first officer did the walk around of the aircraft. The cabin crew also finished their safety inspection of the aircraft and then they started boarding all of the passengers. And once that was done, the cabin crew gave the cabin ready to the pilot. The pilots finished up their pre-flight preparation and then requested push and start clearance from the gate in Stockholm, Arlanda. At this point, there was two pilots, four cabin crew and 172 passengers on board the aircraft. The aircraft taxied out normally and at time 09.30 UTC, that's 11.30 local time, Norwegian Air Shuttle Flight 4311, with call sign Red Nose 4311, took off from runway 08 in Stockholm, Arlanda and started climbing towards the southwest towards Paris. The flight proceeded completely normally and as the aircraft flew in over Dutch airspace close to Amsterdam, the captain handed over the controls to his first officer to start to prepare, set up and brief for the arrival and approach into Paris Charles de Gaulle airport. The first thing he did was to switch his second radio box onto the 80s frequency for Charles de Gaulle in order to listen in to the latest arrival and weather information. Now the information that he received sounded like this. This is Charles de Gaulle information Oscar, recorded at time 10.50 UTC. Runway used for landing is runway 27 right with an RNP approach, transition level 70. Wind 280 degrees, 10 knots, visibility 10 kilometers, broken clouds at 1500 feet, few cumulonimbus at 5000 feet, temperature 19, dew point 14 and QNH 1001. 
this was a quite typical 80s message and it actually showed quite good weather at their destination aerodrome. The only real threat was the mentioning of cumulonimbus or storm clouds at 5000 feet. But what I want you to focus on is the very last bit of this message, QNH1001. This is a very important value because it gives us the reference pressure in hectopascals. In the United States they use inches of mercury instead. But we need to enter that value into our barometric altimeters in order for them to show us the correct altitude as we were arriving into the airport. When aircraft are flying at higher altitudes, what we refer to as flight levels, we all set the same pressure reference, which is 1013.25 hectopascals. And the reason we're doing that is because when we're at higher levels, we are less interested in knowing exactly how high we are above the sea level, and we're more interested in making sure that all of the aircraft that are flying all around us are using the same pressure reference so that we can maintain the altitude separation between each individual aircraft. Because the air pressure is differing geographically all over the globe, it would be impossible for air traffic control to know which setting each individual aircraft has, so we all set the same. But of course, as we are getting closer to our destination and as we're descending down, it becomes much more important for us to know how high we are above obstacles and above our landing airport. And that's when we need to be given the local pressure setting, which in this case was 1001 hectopascals. Now the way that we pilots get this pressure reference officially is by air traffic control giving it to us when they clear us from a flight level down to an altitude later on. But we typically preset the expected value that we've gotten from the ATIS information so that it will be easier to just switch over when we do get that clearance. Now the other thing that we need to discuss before we go any further is the type of approach that these pilots are now preparing for. Remember, the 80s said that they could prepare for an RMP approach for number 27 right? Well, RMP stands for Required Navigational Performance, and these approaches are also sometimes referred to as Barrow RNAV approaches, and they're flown using the aircraft's GPS system together with an internal navigational performance monitoring system that can notify the crew in case something is going wrong with it. In other words, an RMP approach can be flown without any airport-based navigational aids. These approaches are becoming more and more popular now because they're enabling smaller airports that might not be able to afford a big and expensive ILS system to be installed to have a very accurate instrument approach system anyway. On bigger airports like Charles de Gaulle, for example, the RMP approaches are typically used as backups whenever the ILS systems are either not working or under maintenance. And that's exactly what was going on on this particular day. Now, because RMP approaches are flown using internal systems rather than external beams, it's very important that all of those internal systems are properly set up prior to the approach being flown. Now, like I mentioned before, the area navigation or the RNAV part of this type of approach has a monitoring system built in that monitors the navigational accuracy of the GPS system. And on the approach segment, it has a um, tolerance of about 0.3 nautical miles. And if the GPS system cannot maintain that, it will be shown to the pilots, so we will stop the approach if that happens. Now that's just the horizontal navigation part of these type of approaches. The vertical path is built up on altitudes that are set at given RNAV points, following typically about a 3 degrees glide slope. In order for this type of approach to be accurate, it's very important that the correct barometric pressure is fed into the barometric altimeters. So the captain now briefed his first officer on how he intended to fly this approach. The minimum descent altitude was 752 feet, uh, that's about 250 feet above the ground, but the airline policy was to add 50 feet on top of that. So the value that they actually put into their minima selectors was 802 feet. The reason that the airline had a policy to add 50 feet is because of a technicality that we have to follow when flying non-precision approaches. When we're flying a precision approach, like an instrument landing system, an ILS, we fly down to minima that is referred to as a decision height. If we reach the decision height and we don't have the visual references we need, we will then execute the go-around. But as part of the go-around, we are allowed to 
momentarily sink through the decision height. This will happen every time because the aircraft has a lot of inertia. So from the time that we decide to go around to when the aircraft actually starts climbing, it takes a few seconds and you lose a couple of feet when doing so. Now, when flying a non-precision approach, because of the less exact nature of the navigation involved with flying non-precision approaches, we are not allowed to transgress the minimum descent altitude. So on a precision approach, we have a decision height. On a non-precision approach, we have an MDA, a minimum descent altitude. But because the airlines want the pilots to execute the go-arounds using the same procedure, they add 40 or 50 feet onto the MDA. That way, when the pilots hear the minimums call on a non-precision approach, they can execute the go-around exactly in the same way as they did on the ILS. And even though the aircraft continues to descend a little bit, they will not transgress the MDA. Anyway, when the captain had completed his briefing, he made a PA to the passengers. And after that, the first officer requested descent from air traffic control. They received several descent clearances and changed frequency multiple times until they eventually got into contact with Charles de Gaulle Approach Control. Now, here is where things are starting to go wrong. But before I get into the details of that, I just want to share this short message from my sponsor who makes it possible for me to create these videos. Before we move on, let me introduce you to today's sponsor, Curiosity Stream, from the founder of the Discovery Channel. Curiosity Stream offers you thousands of documentary films and non-fiction series on demand, however you stream video available all around the world. Content spans nature, history, technology, music, sports, and my favorite category, science. You get access to all of that, plus original titles for less than $20 a year. And because of that, Curiosity Stream is definitely the most value for money streaming service I've ever come across. Right now, I'm watching a great new series called Proof of Concept, hosted by scientist and fellow YouTuber Diana Cowan. You might know her as Physics Girl. This show was recommended to me by Patrick, one of you guys, and it explores complex concepts with a fun and engaging twist. Since you're a follower of this channel, you can use curiositystream.com slash mentorpilot with the promo code mentorpilot to save 25% off. That's just $14.99 for the whole year or $1.25 per month, which is fantastic. So support me by supporting my sponsor and go to curiositystream.com slash mentorpilot and start enjoying the world's top documentaries and non-fictional series today. Now back to the video. At time 11.32 and 24 seconds, the first officer called up and checked in with Charles de Gaulle approach control. The controller responded with the following message. Red nose 4311, bonjour, descend to 6000 feet, QNH 1011. The first officer responded with 6000 feet, QNH 1011, uh, 1011, red nose 4311. Did you catch that? The pressure that they got from the 80s earlier on was 1001, but the pressure that they've now gotten, the official pressure from the controller, was 1011, which is the incorrect pressure. From the readback, you can hear that the first officer is a little bit hesitant about this value. That's probably why he repeated it. It's likely that the pilots had preset 1001 in order to be able to quickly change it over, and now they had to change it up with another 10 hectopascals. But he didn't question it, and it's possible that he thought that maybe we just misheard the 80s report earlier on. In any case, two minutes later, the same controller comes back and clears the aircraft to descend to 5,000 feet, again repeating the incorrect pressure value. It's hard to know why this error occurred, but these things happen from time to time. People have a tendency to turn numbers around. So, for example, QNH 1020 becomes QNH 1002. And in this case, the call sign, Red Nose 4311, had 11 at the end of it, which might be a possible explanation. But why is this such a big deal? Well, like I mentioned before, the correct pressure setting is absolutely crucial for the pilots to know what their correct altitude is. One hectopascal represents about 28 feet. So if you input an error of 10 hectopascals, that represents an altitude error of 280 feet. And remember, the minimum descent altitude on the approach they're about to fly is only 360 feet above ground. One minute after the controller has cleared Red Nose 4311 to descend to 5,000 feet, 
he calls up an EasyJet aircraft that's ahead of the red nose on the approach queue. He tells the EasyJet aircraft to continue to a waypoint called Papa Golf 650 and to descend to 5000 feet using QNH 1011. But the difference here is that when the EasyJet aircraft reads back the clearance, they said, We'll continue to uh, Papa Golf 650, descending 5,000 feet, QNH 1001. So they actually read back the correct QNH, even though the uh, approach controller had given them the wrong one. This difference in readback was not picked up neither by the approach controller nor by the pilots on Red Nose 4311. Another minute later, the same controller cleared an Air France crew to descend to 5,000 feet, this time using the correct QNH of 1001. That was read back by the Air France crew, but unfortunately, that whole message was done in French. So our pilots on the Red Nose 4311 did not have a chance to pick that up. Red Nose 4311 now received their approach clearance. They start to configure their aircraft, they select flaps 1, flaps 2, and at time 11.36.55, the aircraft reaches its final descent point for the RMP approach from the 27 right, and the aircraft starts descending using the autopilot following the pre-programmed descent path. As they started the descent, the indicated altitude that the pilots could see in the cockpit was about 4,900 feet, but the actual altitude the aircraft was at was 4,623 feet. They were 14.3 nautical miles away from the runway and with a speed of about 180 knots. Another factor that we need to mention here is that as the crew started their approach, a large rain cloud had moved in over the extended center line with quite moderate rain inside of it. This meant that the crew was now completely inside cloud and they had no visual reference neither with the runway nor the ground below them. Because of this, the first officer was reading out distances versus altitude checks as they were descending down the approach. Our approach plates would give very accurate mile-by-mile -mile information about where the aircraft should be altitude-wise as they're moving down the approach path. And as the crew was doing this, these checks were perfectly okay. They showed that they were exactly where they were supposed to be. Here is where the vulnerabilities of a fully internal approach system comes to light. Because the crew had the incorrect QNH reference pressure set, it meant that the altitude and the altimeters was indicating the correct altitude for each of these distance checks they were doing. But in reality, they were actually 300 feet lower than they thought they were. If this same error would have happened on an ILS approach, the physical location of the ILS glide slope beam would have stayed the same. So no matter what pressure setting the pilots would have set on their altimeters, they would have still locked on to that glide slope beam, which would have brought them down towards the runway. In that case, if they would have done distance versus altitude checks, the error would have been shown very clearly. 11.38 and 9 seconds, the aircraft is handed over to the North Tower controller in Charles de Gaulle. The first officer calls in and the uh, tower controller greets them and clears the aircraft to land around the 27 right with a surface wind of 260 degrees at 12 knots. From this point onwards, there are no more calls regarding the pressure setting. The aircraft is still descending through the cloud, but unbeknownst to the crew, the tower controller has forgotten to switch on the approach light system. This will further reduce the chance of the crew establishing visual contact as they get closer. That might sound really strange. How could the tower controller forget to do this? But you have to remember that this all happened during daylight hours. And up until this point, the weather had been very good and it was still good over the airport. This rain shower and this dense cloud was only really situated over the approach path, which is where this aircraft now found itself. So are there no checks that the pilots could have done during their approach that could have helped them to identify this error? Yes, there actually is, but you have to be really switched on as a pilot to notice it. At time 11.38 and 44 seconds, the aircraft's radio altimeter activated and made a call out as it now sensed a height of the ground of 2,500 feet. That should normally happen at about six and a half miles final. And if that happens earlier than that, that's a clue to the pilots that maybe they are much lower than they should be. And it's a prompt to verify that they have the correct QNH set. 
But in this case, the pilots did not pick that up. And from this point onwards, the radio height was displayed on both pilots' primary flight displays. The pilots continued to configure the aircraft to flaps full. And when they passed 1,000 feet height over the ground and the radio altimeter called out, 1,000. They were completely stabilized. They had all of the flaps out, they had completed the checklist, they had a speed of 139 knots, and for the pilots, everything looked completely normal. The only thing that was out of the ordinary was to lower the normal radio height at the distance they were from the runway. But none of the pilots had picked that up. So the aircraft just continued to descend down its pre-programmed descent path, down towards its minima. But now, unusual things are starting to happen inside of the tower. The two air traffic control towers in Charles de Gaulle Airport are equipped with a warning system called MSAV. It stands for Minimum Safe Altitude Warning. What this system basically does is that it has created a 64 nautical mile square around the airport. Inside of this square it has modeled all of the different obstacles and then it has applied a 300 feet safety margin on top of these obstacles. If the system feels that any aircraft within this square is on a trajectory to get into that safety zone and potentially hit a obstacle, it will issue a warning in the tower, both a visual warning and an oral warning calling beep beep terrain alert. At time 11.41 and 32 seconds, the first MSAV warning went off in the tower. The aircraft was then at an indicated altitude of 891 feet, which with the altitude error they were now flying with, was actually an altitude of 601 feet. But remember, that's over sea level. And in reality, that was a radar height of 200 feet, at a distance of 1.53 nautical miles, that's 2.8 kilometers away from the landing threshold. The aircraft was still descending following the descent path, and that gave them a vertical speed of about 700 feet per minute. Now, the correct procedure that the tower controller should have followed in case of an MSAV warning would be to immediately contact the pilots, advise them of the warning, ask them to verify position and altitude, and give them the correct QNH setting. That did not happen. Instead, nine seconds later, the aircraft had descended down to an indicated altitude of 802 feet, which, if you remember, was the minimum that the pilots had set earlier. And since the pilots had not established visual contact with the landing runway, the captain now decided to execute a go-around. The aircraft is now 102 feet above the ground at a distance of 1.2 nautical miles away from the landing runway. But remember how I told you that when the pilots start executing the go-around, the aircraft continues to descend for a little bit longer? Yeah. That's happening now as well. So as the uh, pilots are taking the decision to go around and starting to both disconnect the autopilot in this case and pitch up the aircraft, the aircraft continues to descend. And it is at this point that the tower controller finally calls the aircraft and says, uh, Red Nose 4311, I just had a terrain alert. Are you okay? Do you see the runway? The pilots did not hear or respond to this message. They were likely too focused on the go-around that they had just decided to execute. Three seconds later, as the captain has finished moving the thrust lever into the toga position, the aircraft arrives at its lowest indicated height of six feet above the ground. That's 183 centimeters, basically two centimeters lower than my full height at a distance of 0.8 nautical mile from the runway, one and a half kilometer. That is incredibly low and it mercifully now starts to climb away. But this story is not finished yet. Remember, they're still not down on the ground. Now, one thing that's curious here is that the pilots later stated that they didn't get any type of GPWS warning nor any uh, radio altimeter callouts, which they would normally get at those low radio heights. Now, we won't know why that was the case. That's actually part of the investigation and we will likely hear more details about that once the final report is released. But my personal theory is that this has something to do with a part of the GPWS system called the terrain clearance floor. The way that this part of the enhanced ground proximity warning system works is that it reduces the margin to where you will get a ground proximity warning the closer you get to the active landing runway. And this is logical if you think about it, that this is made to avoid nuisance warnings as you're coming in for landing. But the fact that this incident happened 
0.8 of a mile away from the landing threshold could potentially be the reason for these warnings not being activated. Now, when it comes to the lack of the radio altimeter callouts, that is indeed strange. And we're going to have to take the words of the pilots that they didn't hear it here, because sadly, the cockpit voice recorder was not saved after this incident. But I'll tell you more about that in a second. 10 seconds after the lowest radio height was recorded, the first officer called up the tower controller and advised him that they were executing a go around. And the tower controller responded, Roger, red nose 4311, turn right heading 360 degrees and climb to 5000 feet, QNH 1001. Finally, the correct QNH value was given to the crew. But unfortunately, the first officer now read back, heading 360 degrees, climbing 5000 feet on QNH 1011, red nose 4311. Just reading back the incorrectly set QNH that they already had set. And the tower controller did not pick up that faulty readback. So the aircraft just completed the turn heading north, continued to climb up to 5,000 feet, still on the incorrect pressure setting. The autopilot was engaged and the after takeoff checklist was completed and the crew started preparing for another RMP approach into the same runway. At the same time, in the North Tower down on Chaldegol Airport, the assistant controller in the South Tower that was taking care of the other runways had noticed that the approach light for runway 27 right had not been activated. He contacted his colleague, the assistant in the North Tower, and told him about this. And when the North Tower controller realized that they had missed switching on the approach light system and that they had had an MSAV warning as well, he was replaced and the assistant took over his place and a new tower assistant was called in. Meanwhile, the aircraft had been handed over to the approach controller and was now being lined up for its next approach. Remember, the pilots are at this point completely unaware of the severe incident that they had been part of. In their minds, they had just flown a normal RMP approach with all values stabilized and then executed a normal go around when they didn't get the visual references. They had no idea how close they had been to the ground. At this point, the aircraft was already maintaining 5,000 feet, which was the initial altitude to start another RMP approach. And during the time they were receiving vectors, there was no more radio communication that was pertaining to the QNH setting. So there was no point from this point onward for the crew to pick up that they once again were sitting with the wrong QNH. Instead, the crew now found themselves in exactly the same position like they had been on the last approach, 300 feet below profile as they initiated the descent. They were still inside of cloud at this point and they were descending down the cloud path as they were once again handed over to the North Tower controller. At time 11.53 and 40 seconds, the aircraft was once again cleared to land runway 27 right and this time the first officer called up the tower and asked him to confirm that the approach lighting was actually activated. The tower controller confirmed this. Two minutes later, the next MSAB warning went off in the tower. The tower controller, who was the assistant on the previous approach, now immediately called up the aircraft, saying, Rednos 4311, we have a, a terrain warning. Are you okay? Once again, not following the correct MSAV phraseology. But at this point, the rain cloud and the rain shower had finally started moving away from the final approach path. So the aircraft broke through the clouds and became visual with the landing runway. So the first officer responded, Red Nose 4311, we are on path and we are visual now. Around this time, the flight data recorder indicated that the autopilot was disconnected and that the captain's side stick was moved backward in order to pitch the aircraft back, probably to climb back up to a correct approach profile. Because from this point, if they just came visual, the visual picture would have definitely told them that they were low together with the poppies that most certainly also indicated this. Eight seconds later, the flight directors were also switched off. And that's likely because the flight directors would have indicated a path that was much lower because of the incorrect pressure setting. At this point, the pilot also later testified that they saw the poppies as being two red, one pink and one white, indicating that they were almost back on path here. Less than one minute later, Norwegian Air Shuttle Flight 4311 landed safely on runway 27 right. The pilots taxied the aircraft into gate, they shut down, and unfortunately, they did not pull the CVR circuit breaker in order to preserve the cockpit voice recording. And that's likely because at this point, 
the pilots still did not understand what a serious incident they had just flown through. As I mentioned before, this incident is still under investigation and it's likely that we're going to get even more details once the final report is released by the BEA in France, who by the way writes some of the absolute best incident and accidents report that I've ever come across. The reason I decided to make this video based on the interim report, which I normally never do, was because of how well it was written, but also because in this interim report there are actually some really good safety recommendations that I want to share with you before the final report comes out. The error that this crew experienced is something that my airline referred to as QNH blunder error, and the potentially disastrous consequences of that was identified a few years back when we started flying these RMP approaches. There are several great mitigation techniques against this error, and one of them is for the pilot monitoring to set an anticipated QNH value on his or her primary flight display that they're getting from a separate source, like the dispatch weather that they got during the pre flight preparation, for example. This way, if they're getting a wildly different value from air traffic control when they're being cleared to an altitude, they can challenge that by using the correct phrase confirm QNH. Don't say confirm QNH with a value, just say confirm QNH, because that way there won't be any confirmation bias in there. Another thing that we tend to do is, no matter how recent the latest QNH value was given to us, we tend to always ask to confirm the QNH before we start the approach. That way we can pick up any potential error at that point. In the Boeing, we also have an instrument on our navigation display called a vertical situation display, which is basically the only instrument that can pick up a faulty QNH value by showing the runway depicted either below, like a coffin, indicating that we actually have a too high QNH value set, or above the ground level, showing that we have a too low QNH value set, which has its own potential risks to it. But lastly, and probably the most important point I want to get across with this video is how important it is to be actively monitoring the communication that goes on between pilots and air traffic control and vice versa. If you come across a clearance that sounds weird or a value that you don't recognize, query it. It's always better with one call too many than one call too few. The report also highlighted that there were some misunderstanding among air traffic control personnel about the potential risks of flying RMP approaches and also the correct procedures to follow in case of an MSAV warning. Now, if you want to see a crazy story about a flight where the pilots ended up almost crashing into the sea twice, check out this video. Or if you want to continue to binge on accidents and incidents, use this playlist. If you want to support the work that we do here on the channel, then consider becoming part of my lovely Patreon family. We have weekly hangouts and I'd love to see you there. Or you can also buy yourself some merch. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.